We have been in a series for the last five months. Can you believe it? I couldn't believe it when I, I did the math the other day as to how long it's taken us to do this series. But we've been in the series for five months, and, uh, and so it continues today. 2,000 years ago, in a remote part of the world, we've been discovering an obscure carpenter turned rabbi walked onto the shore of a lake, and there he encountered two fishermen, very ordinary men named Peter and Andrew. And he said to them, follow me. And they left their nets, it says, and they followed him. And then he came to two more fishermen, two brothers this time called James and John, and the same cryptic invitation, follow me. And they left their boats and followed him. And one day he came to a tax collector, um, kind of a despised profession in that day, a man named Levi, and he said those same two words, just this, follow me. And Levi got up, left his desk, if they had desks in those days, and left his profession and left his whole way of life and he followed this man. And we wonder in these stories, at least I do, what else Jesus might have said, or what else these people might have known about them, but the stories don't tell us because they only want to focus on this single command, on these two words. And so this man, whatever you think of him, he walked around issuing what might be called the grand invitation, which is, follow me. And sometimes people would say yes, and for them it meant many things. Perhaps high adventure, learning, in some cases poverty, suffering, very frequent failure, meaning, hope. Ultimately, for some it was death. Everybody, though, is going to die. And the only question, real question is, if you found anything in your life, anything worth dying for. And sometimes he would issue this invitation and people would say no. Maybe that meant security or comfort. We don't know because we, we've never heard from these people again. And so... For the last five months as a church, we've been on this journey through what has been the most impactful talk in the history of the world. Whatever you might think of it, it's called the Sermon on the Mount because Jesus gave it on a little mountain and not on horseback. Okay? All of these months have been pointing toward this moment today, toward this talk, toward this weekend for you and I. And at the end of Jesus' message, having announced what he called his great good news, that life with God, in the presence of God, in God's favor, in God's care, and God's forgiveness, that it's now available to anybody. It's available to you, available to people uh, the world had written off. Blessed are the poor in spirit and those who mourn if they want to be. Having brilliantly described what it is that makes somebody tr a truly good person from the inside, and after explaining why in the care of his magnificent father positioned among us, you simply have nothing ultimately to worry about is his message. Nothing to be afraid of. Having articulated how it is really the love of God expressed through the golden rule, that is the foundation of reality. That is most real. Jesus now begins to devote a great part of the next portion <laughs> to clarify for people the great decision of life. Will you become his disciple or not? And I want to talk to you, to you today, and I want to take any fuzziness out of this word disciple, because a lot of people are fuzzy about it. Many people think the job of the church is to make Christians. Have you hear that? And they think of Christians as, as people who hold certain beliefs, uh, particularly certain beliefs about Jesus, and that as long as they affirm the right beliefs 
or, or trust in those beliefs in the right way, they get to be forgiven and, and then they get to be allowed to get into heaven when they, when they die. And that's the difference between a Christian and somebody who's not a Christian. So they never deal with the fundamental choice, which is, do I actually intend to do everything that this man, Jesus, taught? Do I intend to follow him? Jesus never said, become a Christian. He never said that to anybody. The word Christian is used in the Bible. You want to venture a guess how many times it appears in the Bible? Anybody want to guess? Ralph's got an answer. You think of once. Well, I will say that it's only appear, it only appears in the Bible three times. Okay? And then just as... When it does, as a little nickname for his disciples, you know. And the word disciple, though, is used 269 times in the Bible. And it's simply a learner or a student or an apprentice or a follower. There is no vagueness. There's nothing mysterious or fuzzy about it. If you are a learner, you know it. If you want to learn golf or how to speak Spanish, or how to do brain surgery, then you become a student of somebody through lessons, or YouTube videos, or books. You choose in an appropriate way to be with them, to learn from them how to do what they do, how to become like them. You know if you're doing this or not. If somebody asks you, are you learning to do brain surgery? Nobody says, well, I'm not sure. Let me think about it. Maybe. You may not be a good student, but you know if you're a student or not a student. So the question is, are you a disciple of Jesus? Have you chosen above all else to follow this man? to identify with him, to do what he says to do, to live as he would live, if he were you. This is really important as we consider this, as you consider this this morning. The kingdom will open itself up to you and up to them because these disciples that Jesus had, had uh, spoken to, they had chosen to be with him. They had chosen to learn from him and how to become like him. And of course, in our day, there is no, he is no longer physically present in body. And that's different. But that's, that's a really good thing. Remember, if you've been a part of this series, part of what Jesus taught is that what is most real is what is unseen. He says it a number of times. When you do things, your heavenly Father who is unseen sees what is done in secret. He sees, he knows what is not physically visible, what it is you think and feel way down on the inside. That's where ultimate reality lies. And Jesus will be with you if you want him to, if you ask him to. The fundamental decision, Jesus says, that faces you is if you want to be a disciple, you will actually do what he says to do. That you will obey him. In that, that's the old word, obey. Obedience is another word that perhaps needs to be deconstructed. Because we all have wrong ideas, perhaps, of what Jesus taught. Obedience is often thought to be kind of a bad word in our day. You know, it's generally not a compliment to be called obedient. Teachers will praise kids by saying to their parents, your child is a leader, your child is a risk taker, your child is gifted or talented, where we live, obedience perhaps is so poorly thought of that one of the great compliments in our day is to be disruptive. It's certainly in, the, in business terms, if you've ever been in business, you know, that's a good term to be used, uh, dis, to be disruptive. I heard about a teacher telling a, a set of parents, your child is disruptive. And they were high-fiving each other, thinking that this was a compliment, but they didn't realize it was not intended to be a compliment in that instance, right? Obedience, school, is for dogs. To be obedient conjures up somebody who's just robotic or compliant or weak, a weak-willed conformist. 
And of course, Jesus wanted none of those. Jesus did not say, I have come that you might be a weak world conformist and do whatever you're told by anybody for no good reason at all. A disciple is someone who seeks to obey Jesus with creativity and imagination and initiative and discernment and boldness, joyfully, not grudgingly, with growing ease as the power of God trans to transform, get into what the Apostle Paul called the members of your body. Yeah? In your little hands and what they do. In your little feet, where they go. In your little eyes, what they see. In your little mouth, what it speaks. In their habits that mostly make you up. When this happens, obedience, life, creativity, joy, and love begin to flow out of you quite increasingly naturally with constant humility as you begin to realize that the only way to live in the kingdom is with daily manner. That is a reprieve for the train wreck that would otherwise be your ego and sin. With great courage, for it'll often mean standing in non-compliance under great pressure. With moments of great inspiration when you are gripped by the realization that the only explanation for his unprecedented impact is that he is the most magnificent human, ma most magnificent human being who has ever lived. And is the, you know, it's the greatest opportunity for any human being who has ever come along to be his friend, to identify with him to stand alongside him, to be taken up into what he is doing in this great world that he has created and that no matter what else happens in your life, you can never, you cannot miss that. I've got to be there. I've got to not miss that. And at the end of this great talk, Jesus presses urgently for a decision for every listener to his grand invitation. He says, you are at a great crossroads, you and I. Know it or not, you will either choose the narrow gate that is obedience to him in all things. I will seek to understand and, and with his help and do what it, he says above all else. Or I will choose the broad gate and that's simply anything else. Whatever that is, it doesn't matter. You will either become a good tree that is flowing with so much inner goodness the, you know, that ceaseless flow of thoughts and feelings and intentions and desires inside of you that nobody else can see will become so good that they will eventually issue forth into words and actions and generosity that will make other people, when they look at you, say, what a good God. God must be good to think up somebody like that. Or you'll rot. And ego and self and pride and smallness and pettiness and greed, bitterness and anger will make, make you worthless to yourself or anybody else. You will do the will of his father, which is goodness, joy, peace, love. We read about that in the book of Galatians. And you live or you will not do that will. You will choose another will, your will. And the Bible says, and you will perish. And so you stand at the crossroads. And so this is Jesus. And now these are his final words in this talk. And we'll read it together. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash." 
In the eyes of Jesus, there is no good reason not to do what he said to do. Because what he tells us to do is the best. Rightly understood, it's just the best. It's not compliance. It's not mechanical. It's not a a rule book. It requires discernment and judgment. It means becoming a person radiant with goodness. It's just the best. There's no good reason not to do it. Imagine that you applied. I know some of you, uh, one of you in particular, I know has been applying for a couple of roles this week. But imagine you applied to and got accepted at the greatest company in the world, whatever that company is, I won't say. And you report directly to that CEO. He's not just a brilliant leader and a creative wizard. He is deeply invested in your personal development. And he says to you, you know, Nikki, I want you to work on this project and I want you to develop this uh, you know, competence. I want you to build this team. I want you to care for this client so that, the, so that you can become a magnificent contributor. And what do you say? You say, no, I don't intend to do that. I don't intend to do what you tell me to do. I just want to be on staff. I just want to get paid. I just want an office, maybe a corner office. I want to receive the benefits, but I do not want to do what uh, what you want me to do. I want to do what I want to do. How long do you think you'll last there? Imagine you got selected to be part of the greatest sports team in the history of athletic competition. And the coach there is not just a strategic genius and an inspirational figure. He is deeply committed to your excelling. And he says, you know, he might say, Ammon, I want you to do this training. I want you to watch these games on YouTube so that you're familiar with our opponents. I want you to practice these exercises, Ralph, serve this team. And you say, no, 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 I don't think so. I want to be on the roster, yes. I want to keep you know, the championship trophy at the end of it. I want to have the kit or the shirt or whatever it may be. I want to get those advertising endorsements. But I don't intend to do what you tell me to do. How long do you think it would last, you would last on the greatest team in the history of sporting? Hey. Now imagine standing before Jesus one day and trying to explain to him why you did not even ever fully intend to do as he said to do. Maybe you have good reason for that. And in his fairness and in his understanding and his compassion, and that, who, that is who Jesus is, that it is such that, of course, we can rely on that as part of, of ultimate reality. But people far wiser than me in, the, in his way will tell you that selective obedience will simply not usher you into a life of full confidence in this man. Selective obedience just won't do. There's a line in the big book of AA, which I've been studying uh, for some years now. Uh, These are people who know that they stand at the crossroads between life and death. And this is what they say. They say, half measures availed us nothing. We stood at the turning point. We asked his protection and care with complete abandon. There is one who has all power. That one is God. May you find him now. To make our condition clear, to make his, this decision as urgent and undismissible as possible, as, as he often does, Jesus tells a story. Okay, There are actually two little stories that we've just read, and the way to understand them is to kind of set them side by side and to look at what is similar in each story, and then to look at what's, what's the variable. Where is the difference? Okay, where you locate the difference, you will get the point. And so in these stories, everybody builds a home, a house. That's not a variable. You could replace the word house with the word life. We might put it like this. Everybody is forming a character. Everybody is constructing a soul, uh, badly or beautifully, on purpose or by accident. With God's help or on your own, everybody builds a house, everybody builds a life. 
We do this mostly by the choices that we make, most of which we just don't think about. You know, how, how will I spend my time? What words will I speak? What are the thoughts that occupy my mind? And where shall they come from? What shall I do with my money? What people shall form and shape me? What shall day after day after day of my life go toward building? And very often we deal with this by trying to put decisions off. Should I work on my marriage that I know at some level is in trouble? Shall I deal with this habit I know is a deep flaw? Shall I care for my body? Should I address this drinking problem that at some level I know is serious? Then not to decide becomes its own decision with its own consequences. It's just that way, guys. Everybody builds a house and you cannot avoid this. I cannot abdicate responsibility for this. I cannot pass this off on my parents or my peers or my boss or my family. It's built mostly on not what has happened to me, which is often what I focus on, but those tiny little decisions I'm making or not making all of the time. Everybody builds a house. The second, a second constant is everybody faces a storm. This is not so much a story about storm avo avoidance. We wish it was. There's no way to do storm avoidance in life. Not by having more money or by being really smart. Not even by having a lot of faith in God or praying really hard and boldly. Jesus says the storm will come. Everybody faces a storm. Somehow they surprise us there. And we think we shouldn't. We think we're so smart or strong. The strength of the storm will reveal the foundation of the house. Now, you should know that in Jesus' story, he's not talking really about problems in general. He, he has something in particular in mind. In the Bible, a storm is often used as an image of the judgment of God. How God does not intend to let this world go on being messed up. He will disrupt it and he will set things right. The story of Noah and the storm and the flood, if you remember that, is an expression of the judgment of God on a messed up world, on a wicked world. That's the idea behind Jesus' storm in these two stories. In the Bible, it says every human being is appointed to die once. Whatever you think about this, every human being is appointed to live once. You didn't get here because you chose to. It is appointed that you and I will die and then face the judgment of God. I will be accountable to God for my life one day. Every once in a while, something happens in my life where somehow a part of what I had done becomes revealed or accountable to other people. And that can be pretty sobering to me. Imagine standing before God, though. Everybody builds a house. Everybody faces a storm. The variable in the story, though, is what foundation you build your life on. You will either build your life on obedience to Jesus, identifying with Him, and by His grace doing what He said to do with His help, or, or you will, in your attitudes, in your words, in your actions, in your relationships, and with your money, do something else. What's your choice? I need to tell you this, half measures avail us nothing. You see, my problem is I would prefer half measures. I'd like a little surrender when I feel like it. I'd like a little devotion. I'd like a little generosity. I'd like the help from God when I need it and a little distance from God when I want it. But I cannot live in a half house. And so, rock or sand, follow or not follow. This is the great commitment now, today, that God would set before every one of us 
through Jesus. It's important that this commitment, if it is made, be made soberly and clearly. And not in a moment just of temporary emotion. Jesus' advice on this, given in the Gospel of Luke when he tells another story about a little building project, is this. Count the cost. Before you decide, count the cost as best as you can. So I want to give you a moment to do that shortly. And really, there are two costs to count. One of them is the cost of discipleship. That's a wonderful phrase from a great Christian by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I'd ask you right now in this moment of decision that you count the cost of being a disciple. There will be a cost. What does that mean for me to surrender my will to him? What does it mean for me to lay down my ego and my reputation? And very often there will be something in particular, a habit or a relationship, something that they would have to give up. Maybe it's around money. Maybe it's around sexuality. It's often that way for people. Anger, words. Now the cost is not that I will just try grudgingly every day, try really hard through my willpower to obey Jesus' rules. The idea, excuse me, the idea is that I identify with him. And through his grace that I arrange my life now around practices, around relationships and rhythms through which I receive true inner goodness, life. Grace from the Heavenly Father. And of course, it's a lot like getting married. Again, I've been married for 20 years now. But it's a lot like getting married or having a child. Where there's a lot that you don't know at the beginning. But as best as you can, you count the cost of being a disciple for you. And then, much less often talked about, there is this cost of non-discipleship. What is the price you will pay if you do not follow this man? What is the price you will pay if you do not follow him? For me, that life would be a crushing burden of chronic disappointment, aloneness, isolation, enslavement to ego, desire, image, reputation, just a soap opera every day. Fear, greed, fear, greed. Fear and greed. For me, the cost of discipleship is exceedingly small compared to the cost of non-discipleship. Now, that counting of the cost lies before every single one of us. With this as clearly before the mind as God will allow you right now comes the question of decision. Will you follow this man? When Jesus was teaching, something happened deep in the souls of people who were sitting there. Something that's going to be happening perhaps to some of you right now sitting here. God works this way. I know that he does. I've experienced it myself. Their hearts start pounding and their minds start racing. And something inside of them says, this is it. This is what I've been looking for my whole life long. But I didn't know it. To be cleansed and to be forgiven of all my guilt and regret. And that stupid stuff that I've been doing or have done through grace poured out on the cross in his sacrificial death to know God. Wow. To have life that that has something beyond just worry and fear. To not be a slave all the time to my desire for sex or safety or money or image or reputation. To be a part of my own Tiny little way of God's plan in his great world. To have confidence beyond death. And we say, I must have this. I must have this. I'd rather have what this man has and give up everything else in this world than to have everything there is in the world and give up this man. So I've made up my mind. I'll pay whatever the price is. Gladly. I'll do what he says to do. I'll go where he wants. I'll be what he says I ought to be. And they left the crowd, those disciples. They left the crowd and would become disciples of this man. They would become a follower of this man. They would identify with him. They would love him. They would walk through life as his friend. Imperfectly. Have you done that? 
or have you not? Where do you stand? We're going to have a little time. Perhaps you could bow your heads right now, just for a moment. We're going to have a little time for you to count the cost and talk to God about this. Again, not am I a Christian or will I go to heaven, but have I become his disciple? Maybe you're ready to make that decision this morning. So just for a moment, take a moment or two, I should say, right now. Just talk to God. Talk to Jesus today. Give him your response as honestly as you can. Give him your response to the grand invitation.